Mmm, the first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com. What if I told you you didn't have to cook this Thanksgiving? What if I told you the solution is our friend Bill at the Malibu Kitchen and Country Gourmet? All you have to do is call up Bill, and he will pre-prepare your entire Thanksgiving dinner. I've done this, people. You have to try it. He's got it all. Turkey, the trimmings, the stuffing is unparalleled. The gravy, incredible. The pies, the berry crumbles. He will get it all ready for you. You pick it up on Wednesday. You eat it on Thursday. Look, he's going to do it better than you do it. Trust me. And you don't have to do any of the work. You just have to heat the whole thing up. Call our friend Bill at the Malibu Kitchen, 310-456-7845. 310-456-7845. Bill's Malibu Kitchen and Gourmet Country Market. Uh, you got to get your orders in before Sunday, November 22nd by 2 p.m. Do it. I'm doing it again and I'm never not going to do it. All right, let's start the show. And now, Hangar 56 Media presents Spike's Car Radio, a downloadable cars and coffee, hosted by writer, comedian, and automotive enthusiast, Spike Ferriston. Now, here's Spike. Boom goes the dynamite. How do you like that, starting a show like that? You're so. startled Boom. me, Ferriston. Leave me alone. Boom goes the dynamite. Here we are in Spike's Car Radio. How are you guys? You're on the road. You're in your workshop. You're at home, right? You're supposed to be working, but you're listening to us. That's exactly right. Yes. What are you doing right now? Listen to this. Put down your pen. <laughs> Turn off your computer. Listen to us instead. We're yes. going to have a lot of fun this, yeah. uh, this hour. We're going to help you make money. <laughs> it's better listening to us than doing your job. They're not. <laughs> we have, uh, But we do have a good show for you wherever you are, new friends and old friends. Um, later on, we're talking to a fellow by the name of Marshall Terrell. Marshall Terrell writes Steve McQueen books, and he's got a new book in his own words. And as you know, Zuckerman and I, love Seinfeld, we're all obsessed with Steve McQueen, and this guy is the preeminent. I've never met a guy like this, and, I, and I'll set this up when I set up the conversation, but boy, are you guys in for a treat um, just listening to this guy, because he knows everything, Zuckerman. He knows everything. Imagine me going, okay, what about this? What kind of baseball player was Steve McQueen when he played with the Chino uh, camp for Wayward Boys or whatever the hell he lived? He knew the answer to that question. He went and talked to the other ball players and said, isn't this great? What? I have one question. What? It's his birth name, Marshall. Because Marshall seems like a very convenient name to have for a biographer of Steve McQueen. I didn't ask him that you question because the that's... interview was about Steve McQueen, not, not Marshall. I didn't, I didn't really quite well, care about Well, that's what gets me. Marshall? That's the snag in the carpet that gets me. You know, this is a snag in the podcast right now. I was oh, just ex- I'm excited. Me alone. Just be quiet for a second. Oh, All right. God. Um, in addition to that, we're sponsored this week by uh, Hodinky. Um, we'll read their ad. We love them. Um, isn't it good to have a sponsor that we love, Zuckerman? Yes. Blue Chew. Is, uh, I don't know if they're coming back after what we did to them. Hold that mic up to your Where's mouth. my penis pills? <laughs> I was supposed to get a box of dick pills. I don't, and I can't say with any sort of uh, accuracy that they, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not advertising with us anymore. I think it may have had something to do, but I don't know, just guessing. With me? With the, you talking about how the hole in the penis has teeth and crunches the pill. Wasn't that, wasn't yes, that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do I miss them? I heard the butthole has teeth too. <laughs> oh, Jesus, Zuckerman, please. <laughs> but I don't know, maybe they'll come back. Um, Anyway, uh, terrific show for you guys. Um, it was quite an eventful weekend, too, Zuckerman. I called you on Saturday so excited. Do you remember? I yes. was in my Porsche Drive app 992, the car you and I love. And I called uh, Zuckerman because I was so excited that I had outrun the police. <laughs> <laughs> right? You, had, you shook the tail. I shook the tail. <laughs> Of, and, it, and it's funny because I've often wondered, like, well, how do, how do people get into car chases? Don't they? What do they do? What is that decision process that leads them down this awful road where it's suddenly helicopters, they run, and then they get billy clubbed, right? And, that's, and decision process is kind of a theme in this, in this podcast today. But, yeah. And 
it happened to me. Not really, but kind of. Okay. You accidentally engaged in the conduct. Let me see if I can describe the situation so the listeners understand the situation. Okay, first, Sunset Boulevard by UCLA. There are two lanes moving in both directions. I am stuck behind that thing, and I know listeners will relate to this. The two slow drivers, one on the left, one on the right, driving side by side. On purpose. I don't know that it's on purpose at this point. But I get behind the car on the left because it's a brother. It's a Porsche GT4, white. Uh, It's got ceramic brakes. And my thinking is this guy will understand, hey, you know, it's it's at least 45 miles an hour here and you're driving 30. Maybe you'll recognize as a Porsche brother that I'd like to go by you. He does not. I don't know who this motherfucker is. Oh, good. But I don't, I, I, this, I was offended. I thought there was a Porsche Brotherhood. I thought there was a flashing of lights. I thought there was an understanding that we are all friends. And we're better drivers and we, are, yes. This old guy and his wife and his inability to drive this car and his passive aggressive slowing down, he proceeds to drive like that for quite some time until we get to a street called Veteran, right? Now, here's where it gets a little tricky, but see if you can follow it. All right. They're doing construction at the light at Veteran, and we go from two lanes down to one lane. All right. So the person in front of me on the right decides to take a right turn before that. So now I'm side by side with that guy, and I start to speed up to take the space in front of it. Who can get to that spot first? You understand? Right. So it's two coming into one. Yeah, you want to be first. Now he decides to gun it. Now he decides to gun it. Would you say he's an old CS? What is that? Cocksucker. This is a this is a bad guy. This is a guy who should have his Porsche GT4 taken away. And I hope he's listening. I hope one of you guys, there aren't many white and black GT4s out there, but this guy, if you know him, you need to talk to him and you need to help him understand the left lane is a passing lane and when someone wants to pass, they're allowed to pass and you don't have the right to slow everybody down. At the time, I needed to get home. I was late. I needed to get home for a meeting. Anyway, doesn't matter. Here's where it gets fun, okay? It gets down to one lane, but it's really a second. It goes from three to two because there's a left turn lane there, okay? In the lane in front of us is a big truck, like a U-Haul truck. Instead of competing with this guy for that one spot, I decide I'm just going to go to the right because it's still open to the front. I'm just going to cut in front of all the cars. And I get down there, and then I'll work my way into the left around this truck, Okay. So now I've got the guy beat. He goes screeching, by the way, in his dumb ass trying to race me. Almost, he, all I hear is, <laughs> like he almost sm- smashes into the car in front of him. His wife starts yelling at him. Like, the guy's in big trouble, right? And I'm laughing, and now I'm at the front, and I look to the left, and here's this big ass truck. And I'm like, well, I should go in front of him, right? And I have my car turned on into Sport Plus, right? <laughs> Loud mode. The light changes, and I burst. What I don't know, and this is like where we get into like ticketdismissers.com Instagram feed. They like to put people getting in trouble with the police up there and the stupidity. Here's my stupidity and what I didn't know. To the left of me on the other side of this truck that I can't see past, LAPD. <laughs> There's a car Whoops. sitting right there. Whoops. So I blast off boop, like that. Immediately, I hear whoop, whoop. Like that. I'm like, God damn it. Where did he come from? I look, I look there, but he can't get over yet. So I, I'm taking off. I've only made noise up to speed limit. I was not speeding, but I was making noise. Okay. Is that a, is that a violation? Yes. In what fact, that? it's a bad one. What is it? That's called exhibition display, of speed. Exhibition of speed. Okay. And that's, so, a, that's a two pointer. That's one level below DUI. Yes. Right. Just making a little noise, accelerating too quickly. My tires did not screech. Nothing else happened. What do you say, Judge? Well, I, I, as a, a cop who once pulled me over and, and for that very violation, I said, yes. my car is an exhibition of speed standing still. Yes. I said, That's, <laughs> there it is the problem. I think you're, you're, Did you, I didn't break any laws. Have you ever seen the clip of the guy, I think it's TicketDismissers.com who has it. These are the guys who fix the traffic tickets and, and are sometimes sponsors. 
it's the guy sitting at the light in the BMW and he revs the engine and the cops behind him and he goes, shut, shut up, moron. <laughs> shut the fuck up, moron. That's me. I'm the moron in this situation, yes. right? So I look behind me. I'm like, oh, this is exactly what I need. But I pull over to the right and start slowing down. And I notice the guy can't get into the lane yet because he's in the turn and traffic has moved. So I, I'm driving now 35 miles an hour. He starts racing up towards, but doesn't get close to me, right? But he's jamming with the lights off now and then back on. And I'm like, I get the message. So I take the first, I can't stop on sunset without stopping traffic. There's no right. like, little curb. So I take that first right right on there. On that little street right before the freeway, yeah. But because of the, this guy, this cop is going so fast, he overshoots the street. <laughs> Okay, he goes overshoots the street and goes by me, and I pull over to the right in front of this house. Okay, I see him break. The traffic's coming, and then he realizes he's got to keep going straight and do a U-turn somewhere down towards the 405 and the bridge. Now I'm stopped in front of the house, and I count to like 20, and then I hear the voice of Zuckerman in my head that goes. Why are you helping them do their job, <laughs> Spike? Why the fuck are you helping them? You have plausible deniability. They didn't pull you over. They went by. They're not after you. you you're free to go. <laughs> and I have that. That was com- very good. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting I, better at this. I have that conversation in my head, Zuckerman, and I, and I literally say out loud, okay, Zuckerman, you're right. <laughs> and, I, and I go. And I decide to do that thing I think we've done before, which is, well, rather than you turn back on the sunset, why don't I take some other streets? <laughs> take some other streets and go up into Bel Air. And I do. I go up into the hill and I realize I'm going to loop back and there's a good chance this guy's going to come up the street and I'm going to see him there. But I stopped. I waited a moment. How long do I? I don't think there's any law that says there's I have no to. law that says how long you got to wait. Exactly. You're not deputized in your own arrest. And if you want to stop me and ask me, I'll tell you the truth. But and then, and then I made another left. And I said, why don't I go deeper up into Bel Air? And so finally I got up by Mulholland and I came down some funky way. And I stopped and I called you. And, uh, and I was so excited. Then I was excited. I was excited like I've yes. evaded the police. You said, well, look, <laughs> if, they, if they got your license plate number, let me know when they find you and beat you with billy clubs. Because I, <laughs> I just want to be on the phone listening while that happens. Well, I thought it was funny because, of course, the car's not registered to either one of us. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> pull a Porsche drive. Go down to downtown LA. They wouldn't have seen it anyways. And in my, I, I don't know. The whole thing. I was so excited that I was off. By the, by, by the time nightfall came. I was I w- could not believe that I had done any of this. I was I felt so guilty and I felt really? so yeah, I felt oh, bad. Oh, you fool. This is yeah, yeah. Oh, you ruined it for yourself. Well, I I like to follow the rules oh, and I God. and I felt bad. Oh god, fair Not now for the Porsche GT4 guy. Now but. I'm taking the award back. <laughs> uh, you had gotten the Wheelman award. We had taken it from the thief. I've given you the Wheelman award. Now I'm giving it back to the thief cuz he's not sorry he broke the law, but you are. Yeah. You can't be a wheelman if you're sorry about breaking the law. I I just I'm not built for crime. I and wake up at 4 in the morning. I'm like, "Oh my god, something's going to oh, happen." Brother. But but I do now understand why people run a little bit I, I there's a thrill first of all it's very thrilling feeling adrenaline man it's exciting you also you go well my situation is different they're not going to call helicopters in for me all i did was x y and z right but you can see how this thing would escalate sure, because one split second decision and then you're off in a direction that you later wonder yeah about. and then you get in so deep and then what do you do yeah I mean, I would have killed for that when I was in my if 20s. If it only but, tasered you, that would have been so much fun. It would be great. It, yes. Yes. I would want to see that from some sort of street camera from a weird angle. No, that, they have the tasers have cameras in them. Oh, they so, do? Yeah, yeah. When they heat you up, they, you, get to, you get a recording. <laughs> it's, like being, it's like being on the roller coaster. Could you, you get, heat up a chicken, do you think? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you say heat up, what do you mean <laughs> you know, by that? Heat you up. That's what, trust me, you get hot. When they, I, when they hit you with the little spikes, they go in and they give you the electric charge. You're knocked off your feet. You go flying. And then when those little prongs are still connected in you, they can give you little zaps to, to make you comply. The camera is, is it built in into the gun, into the taser gun, because, yeah, there's a lot of controversy uh, d- around when they deploy the taser. And we've gotten some recoveries for some meritorious uh, clients. I mean, sometimes they do misuse these tasers. 
Wow, I've never seen, or maybe I thought that was just the chest cam or the body cam yeah, that they were wearing. Got it in the tasers. Wow, that must be a shaky shot. I mean, it's alarming and it makes this horrible noise. <laughs> and well, if uh, LAPD or uh, sheriff, if you want to do that to me and you feel like you need to come by. There's uh, two things you. I want them to do to you. And it's always been done. One is to give you the taser shot, and the other one is to you put on the bulletproof vest. And, and then wait, <laughs> and I the third do. one is you wear the suit, and the dog chews you up. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to do that. <clears throat> that would be fun. Yeah. You put on the suit, you, and then you go to try to run away from the dog, and then the dog but eats But the bullet, you. I wouldn't trust the, the armor with the bullet. That, that can, it's too stupid. It can go wrong. Yep. Or they can right. just shoot you in the head. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. Anyway, speaking of shooting in the head, how about some Hodinkee watch insurance? Our buddies over at Hodinkee are the preeminent source for all things watches and have recently announced a new venture, Hodinkee Insurance, created in partnership with Chubb Zuckerman. Chubb. The Blue Chew and Chubb. The world's premier <laughs> insurer of valuable items. Hodinkee Insurance is a game changer in how you protect the watches you love. It was designed by watch enthusiasts for watch enthusiasts, and it makes the process of insuring your watches as simple as possible by eliminating the typical pain points that can make insurance such a headache. Signing up just takes a few minutes. In most cases, you can instantly protect your watches with comprehensive insurance. <clears throat> with the holidays coming up, guys, listen to that piece right there. And ladies, instant protection before you get on the plane or boat. Um, your watch will be protected. Your health won't. But still, <laughs> you should go it. and buy both, Ferris. Huh? You're taking the QE2 over to You might to go the... off to an island somewhere and get on a little uh, enclosed boat. But what I'm trying to say is you can take a photo of your watch with their app and insure it instantly. And you should, because we hear these stories of how these watches are stolen. I guess in the case of the, the, the women who lured those guys to a hotel yeah. room and stole their Rolexes, they would be covered, right? That's a theft. Yes, yes. So there you go. So if you're, you're, you're meeting up with sordid ladies in a bar late at night, you don't have to worry when you're in the hotel room. And they've roofied you. <laughs> Put a toothbrush sure up your butthole. Really, we're going to lose some dinky <laughs> after this. <clears throat> Most cases, you won't need independent appraisals. Most importantly, no independent appraisals in most cases or sales receipts, and you won't even have to speak with an agent to get your quote. Depending on the value of the watch, a few additional questions on protection may be asked. With Hodinkee Insurance, there are no deductibles, and you receive full worldwide coverage with appreciation protection, appreciation. meaning that you're covered up to 150% of each watch's value. So if you insured it last year and it goes up this year, get it? You're covered up to the policy limit. Hodinkee Insurance is available to U.S. residents in all 50 states. Visit Hodinkee.com Insurance, Hodinkee.com Insurance, or download, this is what I did, the Hodinkee app. Uh, you can not only read the stories, you can not only buy the new and the old watches, but now there's a little insurance button. It turns on your camera. You take a picture, and you're covered. It really is cool, guys. You should check it out. It's, you know, this is a game changer as far as uh, watch insurance. And we you know, dig them. Thank you, Hodinkee. Yeah, but I got to tell you. Ben. Ferry, and then thank you, Ben. But Blue Chew, I, I just have to go back Let's to go this. back to Blue they Chew. They said we could say whatever we wanted. <clears throat> go wild. I'm sure Blue Chew will be back. I'm sure he'll be back. I'm pills. just making that up. I didn't get my pills, Ferriston. I want my pills. All right. Well, we'll get them. You saw that I was just, I told Manscaped to get us some of those nose things. Were you on that email? No. No. <laughs> I really, I am so into their stuff. I don't want to give them any more free ads. Yeah. But the sponsors we're getting, I love these guys. I'm using just uh, pretty much every, look, I'm wearing my Mack Weldon pants, for heaven's sakes. I love them. I work out in them. All right, well, lend me some <clears throat> of your, your blue Do you know shoes. with the Mack Welding, not to give them a free ad, but my, I have to train outside now. You can't train inside, and there's a kid in the neighborhood who started the gym, and he's got this outdoor gym, and I, now it's all Mack Weldon. It, it works. I found a use for it. I don't know. I'm in a happy moment about my sponsor. Yes. Um, anyway, let's talk about this. So that was Saturday in the weekend. Yes. Okay. The next thing I did was get ready for uh, our cars and coffee, which was off the charts. And I, I, I have a motorcycle. <clears throat> BMW has finally started dropping uh, press bikes off. And they dropped off the R18, BMW R18 first edition cruiser. Okay, a couple days ago. And uh, just let me just paint this picture, Zuckerman. So it's a big, it's a big ass heavy cruiser. You guys probably know what this bike with vintage cues, you know, based on an older BMW bike. Um, 
It's Sunday morning. It's 7 a.m. It was warm again. It was open. And I get on this bike, open-faced helmet, very important, uh, persols to protect the eyes, and have one of those spiritual moment drives on the PCH where I'm just bopping, bopping the bills in the right lane, feeling the wind on this very heavy cruiser. I'm, I don't believe I've really even ridden a cruiser before, maybe a Harley once or twice, but I'm on this thing, this German thing, and it is incredible. Um, <clears throat> everybody thought I looked odd on it, like it didn't match my didn't match. persona. You sat on it too, right? There, yes. You know, <clears throat> I don't really want to review the bike, but I want to tell you about it and how, how it works. What are you looking at? How much food Gabriella bought us? Why'd you, well, Thank how you, much Gabriella. How much people? And he's like a bird. He has an eating disorder. Yes. That's fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Do you want to be That's on wonderful. the podcast? Come back. Come she by. just was. Um, okay. A couple of things about it. You, when you sat on it, what's the first thing you notice? How Two things. low it was. The, yes. Okay. What I noticed. Do you know the exact seat height? 27 inches. It's low. It's, uh, it's, and it's comforting it's, when it's that low. It's a hugger in a way, and you want it that low with that big head. Because? It's got a very low center of gravity, and you can really sit comfortably on it, and it's so easy to balance despite the fact it must be one of the heaviest bikes out there. I can't say that it's one of the heaviest, but it is heavy. The engine itself is over 200 pounds. The curb weight of the bike is 761 pounds. It's a big but boy. It's, but it's precisely that weight that makes it comfortable and smooth on the road, right? Yeah. So I'm driving out of my uh, driveway, and as you know, I've got a million speed bumps, and I don't even feel them, right? <clears throat> and the weight of it was frightening on the way out there, right? I just thought, how am I going to – but the thing dips and turns – it's not turning like a Ducati or, or, or an R9T or something like that, but it turns just fine, and you, you, get, you get this vibe on a cruiser, right? Like oh, an old Mercedes. Cool. Yeah. There's power there. There's a ton of torque. Um, 91 horsepower, 116 foot-pounds of torque. Max speed is over 110 miles an hour, but you don't need it. It's just there when you want it, right? And you're just getting in a vibe. I haven't figured out the AirPods, EarPod, Helmet, music thing yet but that's the only little piece that was missing and but i'm on a piece of like german engineering right so i don't have that harley thing happening i've got a german thing happening i hear cruiser bike segments are the biggest segment of motorcycle there is yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know that but that's what i heard when i brought the thing out there anyway the thing is black and beautiful uh, delicious um the first ride i took on it you know it's too big to put in my garage because I would have to pull in uh, front wheel forward, and there's like a little bit of a dip down you to my garage. I'm never going to back it up. So I left it in the driveway and left it covered. After I rode it the first time, I, I stupidly put my cover on top of it hot. Uh-oh. Guess what happened? You melted it. <laughs> I melted holes on the pipes. They were that hot. So the next ride— Did you ride, mess up the pipes? <clears throat> the next ride, I get out for coffee with John, and I'm smoking all over the oh place boy. going, what the hell? I get home, and I do the quick how-to YouTube, and there's a guy there who goes, it's an SOS pad, a little water, a little soap, SOS, won't scratch the chrome, comes right off. I do it. It worked perfectly. Really? It didn't scratch the chrome? Perfectly, Zuckerman. The soap, the bluey soap, keeps it from scratching. The whole thing was perfect. It was that moment that I fell in love with this bike. That moment, and then coming back for Bill's uh, on Sunday, relaxed, realizing I was driving and dipping this thing way faster and deeper than I had and not have been thinking about it. This is a great bike. This is a really fun experience. I think the 56-year-old Spike is vibing with it mm -hmm. and the, uh, the attitude it has, the relaxed nature of what a cruiser is. Um, you know, whether it can penetrate the Harley stronghold or whoever's got those, whoever's, you know, selling these bikes, <clears throat> I don't know, but for me, like for a Porsche guy, it's yet another two-wheeled thing that I would jump into. Like there's a world where I would put a Ducati and then I would put this cruiser next to it and then I would have the old bike for like a third different drive.
It was beautiful. What I what I liked in particular was it was it the center RPM gauge says made in Berlin. Berlin built. Berlin built. It was it says it was, Berlin built. Yeah, it was just a cool little unnecessary detail that tickled me. Yeah, air and oil cooled. It's got a beautiful exposed dry shaft that you can look at. You know, it, it's great. I, I really was digging it, and I'm really happy they sent it over there. Um, Leno says he's getting it next. He goes, yeah, when you're done with it, you know, you, you send it over. So that means tomorrow. And he goes, yeah, please, please. <laughs> um, but it's a cool bike. That's, uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm not going to review it past that. The Cars and Coffee, <clears throat> Zuckerman, you were there. Yeah. This Sunday at Bills was off the charts, busy. The week before had been nice and quiet. It had dipped. The weather had caused a dip. Like the Cadillac guys weren't there. Yes. But it was so beautiful, it roared back. Like the stock market. But it, don't you feel like it was critical mass, busier? Well, it, it, than, bigger? I, I was not comfortable. Right, exactly. <laughs> and we had our usual crew of guys there. And, you know, Jay is now, Jay called me Saturday and said, can you hold a spot? And I said, why? I'm going to bring the F1. I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. So Bill, you know, in addition to getting a spot for me and you and Matt Ferrer, he held one for Jay and he brought that car. People went bonkers for this thing. Bonkers. What are those cars worth? 15, 20? Last I checked, 15. How many are, are there? 100? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. The car is stunning. It's black uh, with the center seat. What was so much fun is to watch all the guys, the teenagers and kids in their 20s, going crazy for this thing, right? Crazy. Crazy for it. Absolutely bonkers. In a way that they, I don't think they'd go, not for a Ferrari. They wouldn't go even a vintage Ferrari. The way we would have gone crazy yeah. for a vintage Ferrari. For a 250 GT, they were like doing 250 GTO crazy over this thing. Yeah. And Jay, you know, who's now coming every week, and I wouldn't rule out the new big crowds being Jay and him showing up in all of these great vehicles. He, uh, you know, he's got a, 20 people wrapped around him. He's putting kids in the drivers. He's amazing with the crowd. He really likes to share uh, the, these cars and talks to, have you, st- you know, when, we, when we're hanging yeah, he's out. He's very kind. He will talk to everybody. It does not matter how crazy. It does not matter, hey, can you come over here and look at this? <clears throat> you know, folks will say, hey, can you come over and look at my car? And I, I don't want to leave my coffee with you. I, I'm not going to walk across. He'll, he'll, he just goes. He just goes. He's really amazing. He's a great guy. Great guy. Um, he came over, had breakfast with us, and we, you know, had a fun conversation. Then he says, uh, I think he had left at that point. Um, hey, why don't, we, why don't we go for a ride in the F1? You want to you know go for a little spin? Yeah, I'll just tell you real quick. Oh, go ahead. Here, and here's an interesting phenomenon. You were sitting there at a uh, with with Tony. Yeah, your friend Tony, and and he knows Jay, I think, and Jay and the yes. three of you. <clears throat> and then other people just decided to sit there, not asking really. They just yes. you know, sitting down <clears throat> there and joining. And they were took a, your seat. And some guy took my seat, and then and then and the and the guy wanted. I saw that. Yeah, and then that guy wanted to kind of shit talk another guy in the car business, which yeah, I wasn't yeah. interested in hearing on Sunday. <laughs> uh, you know, you shit talk Monday to Friday. Sunday, I want to be happy. I don't want to hear yeah, shit talk. Yeah, we had a good crew there. We yeah. had Tony Vince Aquera, who runs Sony Pictures. Always good. Car guy. Fun guy. Fun guy, car dealer, and runs one of the biggest studios in the world. And his grandfather was a barber and went to yes. and was involved with the mafia. And <laughs> He's so much fun. Yeah. You got Jay Leno, who, who's a great storyteller. It was good. It was I, fun. I wanted to be there, but I didn't want to. The minute I sat down to listen to you and Jay talk, <laughs> the guy to my right starts you know, shit talking. Yeah, that just guy, happens. That's just, all right. Fuck it, I'm out of here. That, that happens to us all the time, sucker. Remember the, you know, the fire pits and people like to sit down and say hi. It's all right. It, I, I don't mind anymore. But uh, Jay goes... You know, hey, let's go for a quick ride in the F1. So I go, yeah, that, that would be fun, right? <clears throat> so we get up. We get into his car. Uh, everybody goes crazy, first of all. You know, you're going in. You're going to move this thing. You're going to start it up. It's like, you know, Gina Lola Bridget at a movie opening. <laughs> Just the, cr- the crush of cameras come around us. And I get in the car, and I put my mask on, and Jay's got his mask on. And I, you know... In my head, I'm going, wow, this is a really t- small, tight enclosure. But Jay's getting tested, I'm sure, every day on set. And I know I'm getting tested every week, and I had just been tested negative. And then this other guy, I don't know who this guy is. But English guy? Yeah, he's a friend of Jay's. goes, hey, can I come too? And he gets in the car. He gets in the third seat to the left of Jay Leno, 
Who's that guy? He's uh, he's an Tony. importer, exporter. He's yeah, helping Tony. some of our friends bring those yep, cars in. Tony. But he's Jay's guy. Is he not Jay's guy? I don't know who I he is. I don't know if he is or is it. So we get in the car. We all take off. And we're, uh, you know, going up Malibu. And I'm look, I look over and the guy's not wearing his mask. <laughs> I'm like, what? what's it's going a, on here? It, a, you know, and I'm jammed up. It's, it's funny. The seating position is my feet are straight forward like this together. My legs straight up against Jay Leno's leg. Tony's legs up on the other side. Weird. <laughs> weird. Three weird threesome. Three weird guys. It's hilariously fun. The car's making great sounds. And, but I'm, I'm kind of distracted by the guy but, not wearing a mask in course. a tiny bias. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> presumptuous. I suppose part of you would be like, hey, it was just going to be the two of us. Why are you coming along in the first place? And, I, no, no. I didn't care about that because I, I don't. I think Jay and Tony are good friends. So in Maybe. my head, I'm thinking, okay, well, these guys are good friends. This guy, clearly Jay, who's a little older than I am, is not worried about it. But now I'm thinking. Maybe he is. Maybe he never noticed. <laughs> Maybe, he did. Maybe he's too kind well, to say something. Well, the position is he's ahead of him, so he couldn't really see. But there are two rear view mirrors on the windshield. In any case, you know, about 10 minutes in, the guy realized he didn't have his mask on. And, and he put it on and wore it for the rest of the ride. Oh, well, that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, I at know. At that point, every... At that <laughs> but I was... It was an interesting moment for me psychologically because what... You know, and, and I'm sure you're ready to ask and other why people... Why didn't like, you say something? Why didn't I say something? Put your goddamn mask on. Right. And uh, and I don't know. I, I think it was... This was not my ride. It was right. not my thing. You're and not I the fell captain into of the ship. You're, you're a passenger. I was a passenger, but still, I'm a little disappointed in myself that I didn't speak up because I've not, I'm not one not to speak up. I've been in this situation multiple times, but I don't know. It was a mistake. <clears throat> in any case, uh, you know, we, uh, you and I are going on Jay Leno's Garage. This is other news. Wednesday, tomorrow, the day this show is released, to uh, bring the Zagato on and to do a big drive. Hold on for these sirens. This is the ambulance coming to pick me up, by the way. <laughs> <You agree>? Yeah. <clears throat> so I had to get tested this morning anyways, um, and I'm now negative. <laughs> but still, it was a bad couple of nights worry, worrying about this stuff. You know what I mean? Just, mm -hmm. just didn't. Anyway, let's get to the good stuff. <clears throat> what is a McLaren F1 like? First of all, the seating position, hilarious. You know, when you have a car and an exotic, if you were only to have one seat, it would just be pointless because you couldn't share it, right? Jay was going on about how natural the center seat position is in the McLaren. And in this configuration with that center seat forward and these two seats back, it is amazing. And it seems very natural. And you're in the center of the lane. And it, it was really cool. For me, the position was just exotic enough to make it fun, right? I wasn't uncomfortable. I was quite comfortable. But you're wedged up against two other guys. It has British air conditioning, and it worked well enough because it wasn't that hot of a day. And this car, Zuckerman, is very much like the Carrera GT in that it is a mechanical analog exotic, right? Unlike anything you've ever been in, mm. right? I can honestly say I understand why it's worth the money it's worth because this, it, this car delivers an experience that no other car delivers. And I immediately went to the Carrera GT the same way. It is a unique set of factors, uh, a big engine, a sound, uh, a me mechanical in nature, a clutch, mm. and you're shifting gears. It's just a unique situation that you just don't see often. And, uh, you know, Jay's headed up uh, Malibu Canyon. I'm thinking, right? Now, if, you, if, if Jay goes, hey, let's go for a little spin, what do you think? Ten minutes up and then ten right. minutes down. Right. No. He starts heading for the 101. <laughs> so we're, about, we're, we're driving for 45 minutes just to get to the highway. And he goes, yeah, I want to show you guys what it does on the highway. Then we start driving to Santa Barbara. He starts heading north. Holy shit. <laughs> and he, you know, he gets on the on-ramp, boop, guns it. We're changing lanes, boop, guns it. And we are laughing. And the sound of this car is so incredible. It really is... You know, and everywhere people are still taking pictures of us on the highway and hanging out and hanging out with cameras. It was so memorable and so much fun. And the car is nothing what I imagined it, right? It really is worth every dime. When you're in it, you go, if uh -huh. I ever have that money, 
I need one of these cars. How does it relate to a modern McLaren, if at all? Oh, it only here's one. I mean, again, I wasn't driving it. Okay, you look at the uh, the tack, the instrument panel. It looks like they they made had paper dials in there. Like right. no, none of the money went into that. None of that looks McLaren at all. What does feel McLaren is the seat. You know, one of the funniest things about new McLarens is how comfortable mm-hmm. they are. It's a very comfortable seat and in very nice driving position, and you can sit in traffic in a McLaren, and I didn't expect that. I could feel that in this car. And then the exotic nature of it, it's, but it's, it's very primitive. So it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the right cartoon analogy. Maybe it's the early Mickey Mouse right. versus the current yes. Mickey Mouse, right? Yes, it's yes. That. The 1930s. You, yes. Yeah, it's that, and it's very hot roddy, and it, and again, it's got a Carrera GT like thing happening in that you can tell a Carrera GT is a Porsche, but it's not like any, any other Porsche other. you've ever driven. And if you're a guy who wants to shift gears and uh, push, use a clutch, and this, you know. It's great. You'd have to. If you were collecting McLarens, you would have to have this, this car. This is a holy grail. Anyway, um, long and short of it. Of course, it, you had $15 million. Thank you, Jay Leno. I know we're going to be with you today. I'm going to thank you in person. But that was a real thrill. The internet went crazy. Instagram went bonkers for that. They went crazy for the drive. I mean, it's really funny to see the fan base that that car has and uh, deservedly so. I don't think we could ever get Jerry interested in one. He's our richest friend. Um, Let's work on it. <clears throat> right now, we're going to, uh, today, Zuckerman, or tomorrow, we're going to do uh, bring the Zagato on Jay Leno's garage. You and I, we're going to be up there together. Are you nervous? Yeah, Chris, we're like bringing the Italian car to the Pope. Leno, the Zagato, oh, that's the, Leno. That's the easiest part. I mean, are you nervous about going on TV? Why do you have to bring that up now? I'm trying not to think about it. I like to, <laughs> I'm trying to be in denial. I don't want to look in the mirror. I don't want to see how ugly I am. I don't want to think about that. And my, if you make you me know, think, I insisted that you were there. If I think about it, dummy, and I've been thinking about ways to get out of it. As we're do sitting here. You know here, that I almost said I would rather you do the segment. I just want to watch. <laughs> no. I, okay. I think you're going to be great, by the way. I think oh, you're, thank you. Keep fucking me up. Let me tell you why. All right. First of all, you and I are just going to have a blast standing up there, right? It's it's Jay Leno's Garage, CNBC. It's just fun. Lots of people who aren't normally on TV, John Wilhoyts, people like this, they all go on there. You have such an encyclopedic knowledge of facts, which I won't. I'll forget everything when I get up there. So when they say what kind of carburetors, you'll go Weber and, you know, here's how many CCs, 1921. You'll know those things. Um, But also we'll get to play off each other, which will be fun. And I think I would imagine Jay Leno's going to make a bunch of uh, slip and fall banana peel lawyer jokes. <laughs> At my expense. <laughs> At okay. Expense. <laughs> Tell him to make some Jewish jokes, too. I like those. <clears throat> but I know, I think he mentioned when we were in the McLaren that he said we could maybe uh, drive some of his stuff. Like he's got. Okay. Now, I have a, a day tomorrow. I have to know is this going to go all day? Am I out the entire day? I don't think so. I think this will be a couple of hours. Okay. I think it's just a stand up and then. Because of COVID restrictions, the drive, I don't, I don't know how the drive works now. I, I think it might just be Jay by himself, and, but I can stay with the car. You don't have to worry about that. I'm going to meet you up there separately. Yeah, you and I will drive up, bring the rally car. I'll, I'll pick up the Zagato this morning and gas it we up. We should meet around sure here. Clean. Huh? We should meet over by this location because if we're going to Burbank. Well, it's easier for me to just hop on okay. the uh, 405. Then we'll coordinate. With, you'll I'm, tell I was me what worried call, about doing You'll tell me what the call time is. Is that the proper language? No, they're going to send you a call sheet. Yeah, you'll know. What's a call sheet? Call sheet is based on today's shoot, if they're still on schedule, there's a 12-hour turnaround for your crews. So let's, let's say, and they probably won't, they won't go late, so they can start on time tomorrow. So you get a call sheet this afternoon that says we're starting for sure 8.30. You have to be there at 8 o'clock for makeup. And uh, what do you mean? And girdling. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of that today. I'm gonna go. Ro- I'm gonna go running with winter clothes on and hefty bags on top. <laughs> Sweat it all. It's car guys watching this show. Nobody cares what we girdling. look like. Relax. You don't even have to dress up, Zuckerman. I'm gonna go in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. It's great. It's a great show to do. You're gonna love it. And the fans are gonna see the Zagato. Um, I think I believe they're doing an episode on resto mods, and I've already. Uh, divorce them of the idea that this is a Resto Mod, because technically a Resto Mod is an old car with modern parts, but we'll get into that on the show. This is a sanction. And we will say hello to Paolo and Andreas. Yes, the we makers have a lot to say car. about them. 
and uh, what they did right and what they did wrong and what <laughs> they don't stand behind uh, Zagato. And what they don't stand for. And what they don't stand for, our growing resentment towards that company, um, which only enriches the history of a beautiful vehicle. <laughs> it makes it's gonna it fun be good. for us. Let's, uh, let's get on to our guest. Let's see. How long have we gone on here? 37. Forever. That's great. I was going to bring up your neighbor in Malibu and uh, the barking dog. I thought that was funny. That made me laugh on Sunday. About, about them writing? Yeah, yeah. Tell everybody what happened. You had, you're in this temporary house because your Malibu house the burned house down. The house in Malibu burned down, so we moved into a, a trailer community called while the, the Point second one, While it's being Club. rebuilt. Yeah, during rebuilding. It's already been, it's been two years since the house burned down. Wow. And we're really just breaking ground. Wow. We're hoping that in January of 2022, we will have our house back. In the meantime, I bought a trailer in the Point Doom Club, and it's a trailer park. It's a snooty trailer park. It's but a it's Malibu tra- trailer park. It's a, it's a trailer park. different. <laughs> My son, Dale, refers to these people as trailer snobs, uh, which is it's kind of funny juxtaposition. But for the price of a trailer in Malibu, you could probably buy a mansion in Georgia. Uh, yes, there are there are trailers. <laughs> they're not cheap, Zuckerberg. They're, they're cl- many are for a million dollars, and there's some as man- much as $2 million for... Back, wouldn't you, back in Rockford Files days, they were probably cheap, right? Well, could, yes. Right. Absolutely. And I, I thought you couldn't buy the property. You but don't. You, could, you, buy, you buy the trailer and you buy, you, you buy the space. It's like a, a 99-year lease, although it, so it, it who renews. Owns, who owns the dirt? Ah, well, you got it. There is a family owns the dirt. And they, I say they're like the Jed Clampets of the trailer world because I think the current owners parents or grandparents started this thing point doom at that time was known as poverty point it was not a well-to-do area and there's there's like got to be 10 acres there of prime land and now that this space rents there's 300 trailers there's some of the space rents are over three thousand dollars could you imagine what they're generating every month with 300 spaces half a million to a million dollars a month wow and that's and, really cool. And so, but we do have trailer neighbors, and we have a little Pomeranian, and the Pomeranian tends to bark when she's <laughs> left alone. So, so you, I love this because to me, this is the trailer Zuckerman that you've discovered. This person, well, okay, <laughs> the, the, the guy, trailer park the guy Zuckerman has his prison mustache. <clears throat> so you know your that? dog is barking a little bit, right? And, yes, and, and okay, the neighbor lady comes over, and on our sidewalk in front of our trailer, writes. Bad dog owners <laughs> in chalk and chalk. Wait on your walkway. Yeah, on our, on our <laughs> yeah, nice passive aggressive move. Um, she's like an old, dried out, old, crusty, bitty, like jerky lady, and and the husband's got a prison handlebar mustache. Did you see her do this? No, no, no. But who every- discovered the writing? Well, when the when when Andrea got there, or Kate, your wife, yeah, and Andrea Kate, uh, when they got there, they saw it, and then I and then Andrea <laughs> called me up, uh, yelling about it. What uh, did she say? These people, how rude, and this okay. and that, and they said, and then I guess she went over there, and the lady said, "Were you upset?" Not really. Okay, so she goes over there, and the lady says, "What?" And and I guess Andrea said, you know, something like, how rude, how dare you? My dog doesn't bark, of course. You know, of course, it's like my kid didn't smoke weed and break your window. Yes, no. My dog doesn't bark. And the lady said, I'm going to sue you oh. and I'm going to call the ASPCA. And I said, at that point, I said, well, that's a good one. I, I said, I don't normally play the lawyer card because saying I'm a lawyer is like announcing I'm an asshole. But if somebody opens with that, I thought to go over there and say, lady, you know, you want to you want to have a fight like. I hope you got enough fight in you because you know, it, your eyes just got really crazy and yeah. open <laughs> and but, the smile of a lion before it kills yeah, a gazelle I mean, is what I just on. saw. She wants to, she wants to mess with me. But then again, I, I, did you go over there? Did you no, say because it? I'm mature now, Ferris, and I'm almost your age. You are. And, and I'm when almost, will you be my age next week? Yeah. On Sunday. <laughs> and so I decided that, that, in a way, if I want to fight with the trailer neighbor, yes, they're trailer people. I'm slumming it. I'm, you know, they probably <clears throat> live for this. This is what they live. This for. isn't your neighborhood. 
might yeah. be a nicer way of saying yeah, it. And so, so you're well, just a guest here. And right. So this I'm not, lady I'm, is a Karen. She's yeah, nuts. Yeah, I don't want to just like go and throw my weight around on her. Like if she comes up to me and gets <clears> in my face, then I'll, I'll strangle her. But if... Uh, so but, what would... I mean, the, the, I love these... Compl- it's always... And you obviously deal with this. It reminds me of my dad. He would do this when he didn't like something the neighbors did. I'm calling my lawyer and then I'm calling the police. It was all bluster. There was nothing behind it. I, what, what the fuck is the ASPCA going? to do i tell i tell you oh, what the dog's barking i have my nuclear weapon what's that well if they complain i'm gonna say i saw you guys i saw your husband looking in the window <laughs> <laughs> at my daughter <laughs> and i figured that'll shut them the fuck up i'll never hear another word from these people would you recommend that people listening do that if no, in case I they figured, get quarter? i figured uh, they, what's gonna i said god these lunatics why not make another spurless accusation well, i just figured as long as they're being crazy i don't really want to <laughs> roll around in the mud with these people so i just figured i saw your husband looking in the window at my daughter and then <laughs> i figured that would be the That's end good. of it. Yeah. There you go. Now you know how to think like Zuckerman. <laughs> I just love the moment. I'm going to call my lawyer because you know she's got nothing. The whole thing is nothing. Why can't people just talk? Why wouldn't just she just come over and, and say talk? something? Yeah. Just come over and say, you know, your dogs are barking now. Because you guys love your pets more but, than anybody I've ever seen. And guess what? So we never leave the Pomeranian alone in there. We... If if any if anyone's leaving, last person out takes the dog. Yeah. The dog has gone to Baldwin Hills. The dog is not there. She still claims the dog's barking. So now we know she's crazy too. Oh man. Or crazy er too. I love that. Yeah, so I'm glad I didn't mess with her, Ferriston. There's nothing to be gained. I'm getting very mature. I mean, it must mean I'm about to die. Now yeah. that I've reached this point of wisdom. No, it's just temporary. You'll have your moment coming up. Um Let's bring on our guest. Um, a few days ago, I chatted with the name, uh, a guy by the name of Marshall Terrell, who uh, reached out to us, wanted to come on the podcast because he knows we like Steve McQueen. He's got a new book, In His Own Words, that's going to be available on Amazon December 1st. <clears throat> I believe he mentions in the interview where you can get it now. Um, I was sent an advanced copy of this that I received Friday at 5 p.m. And if you know anything about Spike First and you know where you I am. read. <clears throat> that too, that too, it's actually relevant that you said that. I'm uh, on Fridays at five lighting up a Boulevard Cuban cigar in my backyard with my dog, with the lights on, um, uh, looking at watches, reading news, catching up on the week. And this PDF of this guy's book comes in four or 500 pages <clears throat> of photographs. The concept of the book is like Instagram, Zuckerman. It's Beautiful photographs of Steve McQueen from the very beginning of his life to the very end of his life, to the cancer years. And quotes, um, ah. three or four quotes stitched together over the picture that, in, that inform the photo so you're you looking at. you able it. to comprehend this. So I was just going piece by piece, you know, the Brentwood piece and the Brentwood house up the street, the cancer and the, so many pictures of cars, Austin Mini Coopers and, you know, a racing Ducati I hadn't seen. <clears throat> and I was losing my mind. Um, I, I sent it to Jerry and I go, you're going to lose your mind. You got to get a copy of this book. But here, look at some of these uh, pages. Um, the book is incredible. The next day I got on with the guy and did the interview with Marshall and this guy is one of those guys. Like, if you have any Steve McQueen question, any, like I said, I was testing him through the interview, and you're going to hear it. When I'm asking about what kind of baseball player he was, Ooh. when he says, I went back and I talked to some of the guys on the team, I, my mind was blown. Incisive interviewing, Ferriston. Maury Povich-like. Well, just, I love anybody who loses their mind. And like I said, this guy's written four or five Steve McQueen books. Um he was able to tell me how many cars he owned when he died and how many motorcycles he owned when he died. And he knows where most of those are. It's that, that type of stuff. It's very useful. Anyway, uh, here's my interview with Marshall Terrell. All right, here we are. There's Marshall. Where am I talking to you from? You're hey, in I'm, Mar- in, I'm in Tempe, Arizona. Tempe, Arizona. Wow, nearby. It's nice to meet you. Thank um, you. I'm really looking forward to this chat uh, because the listeners know I'm a huge steam, Steve McQueen nut, not, not as big as you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, you know, this isn't your first book about Steve McQueen, but, um, it's funny. 
I was uh, I like to smoke a cigar a couple times a week in the backyard here in uh, Brentwood, and and right as I was lighting up, um, my producer sent me your book, the PDF of your book, uh, in his own words. And boy, did I go down a wormhole of fun with <laughs> Steve great. McQueen. Um, I really enjoyed it um, because it's, you know, and, and, and I think I want to start at the beginning and talk about Steve McQueen's life. But what I really enjoyed about your book was I had seen some of the photographs. There, There's a slew of photographs I've never seen before, but there was context Yep. There were quotes wrapped around them and small stories that were very uh, bite-sized. And, you know, for a personality like me at that moment where I don't want to really dig in on deep pages of information, I couldn't have had more fun. So, I, first of all, I just want to thank you for that. <laughs> you well, thank were you. really a memorable cigar smoke and a lot of fun. Um, but I learned so much about Steve McQueen. You know, first of all, just tell everybody where you got the idea for this book, because I thought it was kind of interesting. I had no idea that Steve on his deathbed was thinking about uh, writing a book about his life. Right. Yes. Well, and, and it was with someone that you the name you probably know and, and someone who I had met a couple of times is a real gentleman. His name was Charles Champlin. And at the end of Steve's life, he had cancer. And um, there was talk that he was going to do a book. And there were some meetings with Champlin. And then Steve's uh, cancer just, it was just too aggressive and was uh, advancing. And so that idea was scrapped, which was what, sad. Can I, can I ask you, because I'm asked all the time, what kind of cancer did he have? He had a form of cancer called mesothelioma, which is rare and deadly. And it's caused by asbestos inhalation. Uh, it usually takes 20 to 30 years to form. And he got it, we believe, uh, when he was in the Merchant Marines. He, was, he went a wall. And um, when he came back, you know, back then they had police officers that were given kind of uh, not wanted posters, but uh, straggler notices. And McQueen was one of those straggler notices. So in addition to going AWOL, he was going to get some time for that. He gets into a fight with this police officer. So when he finally gets in front of the military judge, he adds on time for that. So how that relates to his cancer is that when he um, his punishment is that he's going to. Uh, uh, rip out the pipe piping in the hull of a ship. And those pipes were loaded with asbestos. So he was inhaling all that stuff. Um, and that was in December of 1949. And he was diagnosed with cancer in December of 1979. So it took a good 30 years for it to develop oh, in, wow. in his body. Yeah. So, so now he's, um, Let's just stay in the cancer for a second. He, where was he living at the time, you know, toward the last years of his life? Was it here in Brentwood or was it the Santa Paula house or was it both? It was, it was the Santa Paula house, but you skipped the Malibu house, which was right. kind of a cool place. But yeah, he, he had discovered, he, he just wanted to get into flying airplanes. I mean, he had done the motorcycle thing. He'd done the car thing. Um, and all of a sudden he decides that he's going to fly antique airplanes and Santa Paula, which is about an hour north of Los Angeles, um, he is, is the antique plane capital of the world. And he decides that not only is he going to start flying there, but he's going to actually live there. And not only is he going to live there, but he's going to live in an airplane hangar with all of his motorcycles and his toys. And when I first wrote, <laughs> when I first wrote about that, I thought, why would a movie star want to live in an airplane hangar? Well, <laughs> I know a couple that do this right now. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that Santa Paula had a celebration for him uh, in, that, in 2007. And I went with his widow, Barbie, um, and we spent a couple of days in the hangar uh, in anticipation of it. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And I went, OK, now I get it. I totally understand why you did this. I went, you know, when the house was up for sale uh, 15 years ago, my buddy called me up, who's a Steve McQueen fan, and said, let's go up. Let's go buy it. <laughs> so we drove up to Santa Paula. We looked at the house and, you know, we were like, well, you know, without Steve McQueen, it's not much of a house. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice place, but it's not the amount of money they're asking. And we said, let's get some lunch. And we walked down the street. There was a little golf course of some kind. And, and there were these three guys sitting at the bar. And we ordered some beers. And they, they finally looked at us and said, what are you guys doing here? And I go, well, we're looking up at the McQueen house. And they're like, oh, we're, we know Steve. We, we knew him when he was alive. And we had this great conversation with these guys about, about Steve, their neighbor. 
you know, and it was much better than trying to buy this souvenir was just getting some insight from his buddies, you know, over a beer. Um, so, well, let's start at the beginning, you know, because I'm such a fan of his and you, you, you know, so much. And I think if I just ask you questions that I'm curious about, I think that'll kind of take us through the book. <clears throat> um, Steve McQueen, he's got, you know, if he were around today, he would probably be in trouble. <laughs> he would probably be in trouble with the Me Too movement oh, and absolutely. everything else. And I know I used to have judgments about him because of the cocaine use and everything else. But he had a tough upbringing, right? right. I mean, tell everybody how his life started. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. He would have had a tough time in the Me Too movement. But I always say you have to look at his childhood to really understand who the man was and why he reacted to the things that he did and why he did the things he did. Um Tough childhood. Both parents were alcoholics. Um, father decides to take a walk when he's six months old. He is in the merchant marines. And so he's able to avoid Steve for the rest of his life, avoid detection. Um, and then the mother was, I think, 18 or 19 when she gave birth to Steve, was a party girl and um, was an alcoholic. And, you know, she probably met her husband in a bar and wasn't very nurturing or loving and so she pawns Steve off to her parents, uh, Lillian and Victor Crawford, who are very, very strict Catholic people, who raise him for the first four years of his life. Then, of course, the Great Depression hits, and then they have to move lock, stock, and barrel. They have been successful people in the Indianapolis area, and they've got to move. And they, they, they live in a – now they live in a uh, cook shack, which is an abandoned rail car on the land of Claude Thompson, who was Steve's granduncle. And Steve moves into the big house. His, his, his granduncle is a hog farmer. Um, so Victor and Lillian um, are relegated to, to, to this cook shack. So then he's passed and off. And where, where is this? What state is this? This is in Slater, Missouri. And this in is Missouri. a very, very small. I mean, you, I can't even think of the nearest town. The nearest town is called Marshall. But um, it's about two hours from Kansas City. Um, and it's it's in definitely in farm country. So, um, you know, Steve, Steve is raised with a very uneven hand. His uncle Claude is married to a young former dancer. Uncle Claude <laughs> uh, is quite the ladies man. And so Steve kind of um, patterns himself after him because uh, because even though Claude is, you know, a very, very older, he's married to this younger girl. Claude's still fooling around. Um, and you know, st you're laughing because it's funny because it's true. This is, this is, this I is can't Steve. believe anybody would date Claude to begin with. <laughs> well, an attractive hog farmer, an attractive hog farmer named Claude. Well, <laughs> who else do you have? It says the young dancers. <laughs> so, um, so then what happens is, is that his mother, uh, uh, Julian, uh, gets remarried and, you know, she relocates to Los Angeles. So she calls for Steve. He gets there and then he, he encounters a very abusive stepfather. So, I, I mean, you know, every every where he Steve turns, you know, it's it's a negative situation. And so Steve basically turns to the streets and, um, you know, that's kind of where his refuge is. And so he he does whatever he can to survive. I mean, he. He breaks into shops. He um, uh, uh, jacks uh, uh, hubcaps, which uh, which I think must be a lost art form now, because I don't know if anybody steals hubcaps anymore. <clears throat> right, right. They might steal rims, but not hubcaps. No, they so steal the whole <laughs> wheel. <laughs> yeah, they, they, you you come out now, and your car is on cinder blocks in my neighborhood, and there's nothing. <laughs> it's impressive how quickly oh. they can do it. So, um, so what finally happens is that. Uh, He's out of control, and then she sends him the boys' Republican Chino there. And I'm right. I'm fairly sure you've probably been to the car show there. Yep. Um, and so Steve, um, from the age of 14 to 16, he 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 encounters discipline for the first time in his life, and he he's he's given some structure. Um, and it's it, it's it's enough structure to where his next move is going to be that he's going to join the Marines, and he's in the Marines for the next three years. Uh, and again, he's still a little wild. Uh, like I mentioned, he he went AWOL, um, but that was woman driven. You know, when <laughs> I, I consulted a, um, a I consulted a former Marine sergeant, and he said, "Oh yeah, guys did it all the time." He goes, and he basically said they weigh it in their minds. Okay, I'm with this girl. Uh, I'll I want to spend another extra two days. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to do some time, but yeah, it'll be worth it. 
So he said that's probably what was going through Steve's mind. Yeah, and, so, and uh, you know, as I go through your book here, I'm flipping through it. There's so many. He talks about when he was 13, uh, you know, having his first drink and being hungry and stopping at a farmhouse, and a woman invites him in, and he stayed there for a few days. Yes. <laughs> Boy, did I learn a thing or two, is a quote. <laughs> And then you flip down a little more, and then you see him on his Little League team. Or it looks like actually a high school team. Uh, it's, in the it's, the boys boys Republic. Yeah, it's the Boys Republic team. <laughs> so um, there's another thing I did not know about him that, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Steve McQueen, but, you know, baseball. Now we have baseball in common. Um, well, and, and the interesting thing is uh, uh, I interviewed a gentleman from there who was on that baseball team, and I said, well, was did he, was he a starter? He said, nah, he wasn't a starter. He goes, but he, he got enough to where he could use that scene in The Great Escape to where he could – throw the ball and catch it with a mitt. So he goes, oh. he, probably used, he probably used that experience from the Boys Republic. <clears throat> that is, it's so much fun. I mean, that's what's so nice about the format of your book. Um, you know, when listeners want to buy this, where are they going to buy this book? Because everybody's going to want this thing. Well, thank you. Uh, the best place to go is daltonwatson.com. That's directly from the publisher. And you get it much faster that way. Uh, it's available now through them. And it'll be available December 1st through Amazon. And then Amazon will have it right before Christmas. Um, That's right. <clears throat> let's let's keep going here because now I'm looking at the Army years where he's uh, – <clears throat> did he join or was he drafted? He Yeah, he, he actually enlisted. He, you know, the, the, the problem was is that – I'll give you the, the sequence and you'll see why he joined. He, he, um, when he, when he, he, he rejoined his mother in New York City when he was right. 16. She called for him. He gets there. It's a bad situation. And so he leaves their house. He goes into a bar. He, he bumps into two guys. And this sounds like a fable, but it's not. It's true. He bumps into these two guys named Ford and Tinker, and they tell him how wonderful the Merchant Marines is. So he gets on a ship. He gets on a cargo ship, and he's handed a mop. And so he, he's like, well, I didn't sign up for this. So the pl first place he, he gets to, he ditches. And so he goes to San Juan, Puerto Rico, where he's a towel boy in a brothel. <laughs> and the famous quote there is, you know, they, they love blonde hair, blue eyed boys. <clears throat> Towel boy is a a phrase Letterman used to use. And now I'm just wondering if that's where he got that from, if he knew that little bit of business. That's so funny. And so he's well, you, a towel boy see, in a brothel. Yeah. Uh, if you see the movie Night Shift with Michael Keaton, there's a there's a Keaton plays a towel boy in, in, in a brothel for a little while. So that'll give you some reference. Towel, please. That's right. He snaps his to, fingers. Yes, that's crazy. Oh, man. So when, right, he get, going. When, he, when he gets back, he um, <laughs> he's charged with vagrancy because he's sleeping in a park. And mm -hmm. then he does time on a chain gang. Jeez. And, if, and if you need reference for that, you know, you've got Cool Hand Luke for that. Right, right. So he, then he finally gets back to New York City. And, you know, he's doing things like he's making sandals. He's carrying out condemned radiators in buildings. You know, New York time, New York City at that time, I guess it's kind of reminiscent of New York City today. But uh, it was a rough place back then. And he decides, you know, he says, hey, when, when are you going to get with it? You know, he, he had visions of himself at the age of 50, uh, standing in a street corner asking for change. And so he said that's when he decided that he was going to join the Marines. And he said he joined the Marines because – they were the toughest. So he wow. enlisted at the age of 17 with his mother's permission. And um, the next thing you know, he's, he's on a, he's on a, a train to uh, Paris, Paris Island, South Carolina. It's, you know, it's such an amazing story. It's almost like the life of a novelist, really, except right. he's getting all of these experiences and he's going to, you know, channel it into acting. <clears throat> I'm, I'm here now he, <clears throat> where he's working at his friend's TV repair shop followed by him playing his uh, saxophone <laughs> where he contemplated becoming a jazz musician, which yeah. is really an interesting shot for me. He's sitting there playing an alto sax, I think. And I'm looking now to my left where I have a picture from that Jim Marshall took of um, Miles Davis yes. and Steve McQueen together. Right. Well, and and they, now and there's context for that. They knew well, each other. Right. They knew each other in the fifties and Steve hung out with all those jazz guys in the fifties and he had contemplated becoming a jazz musician, but I never his knew complaint that. was, well, and he didn't have any musical ability. 
But, <laughs> but he's again a perfect actor. <laughs> I'll play a jazz musician. <laughs> and if you see him holding that sax, it looks like he knows exactly what he's doing. He looks perfect. Yeah, he knows the exact shot. No, you see the actor in him. Follow then by him in a beautiful 1948 MGTC Roadster. Uh, yeah. Look at that. That he won in a high stakes poker game? Right. Uh, tell and me you, that as story. you can see, well, it, you can see all these life experiences. I mean, he puts it on film. So, for example, you know, with, with that high stakes poker game, you know, he puts it to use in the Cincinnati kid. And, you know, with cars, he's, he's always, you know, racing in movies. So his, his movies become almost autobiographical in a way. That's the beauty of following Steve McQueen. It's like, oh, okay, he used this from this. He used this from here. He used all those wonderful life experiences and just put it all on screen. Where are you getting these photographs from? I've well, seen hardly any of this stuff. Well, a, a lot of it are f from just different collections. You know, I've been at this McQueen thing now for almost 30 years. So I get people from all around the world emailing me. Um, and with the advent of the Internet, my first book on McQueen was before the Internet. And pictures were hard to come by. But I get them from a variety of sources. The last third of the book uh, was given to me by his widow, Barbara McQueen. We did a book together called The Last Mile. And so she had some outtake photos that we didn't use for that. And I just asked her, I said, hey, can I use these for this book? And she generously agreed to do that. Um, some other pictures, uh, a lot of them were from the Motion Picture Library Academy that have never seen the light of day. Um, others are just from private collectors who ha either had encounters with McQueen and took pictures and said, you know, and I just asked them, hey, would you mind if I use this? Some, some are from collections that I had to buy. There's one really cool one, which I know you're gonna remember, of Louis Tavern in New York City in the 50s. And that mm -hmm. was from the Fred McDera estate. And um, I'd always wanted to know what Louis looked like. And so I just did a search and found that. I'm on so, that right now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, it's just like. Oh, I don't even, can't even comprehend what I'm looking at. Is the left building going to be demoed? Is that why there are X's on the window yep. there? Yes. Wow. And the next to it is the Circle and Square Theater where McQueen tried right. out tried out for a play and I guess he didn't get the part um, <laughs> but I mean you, you can see kind of how hard scrabble the 1950s were in New York City. yeah I mean, yeah that was a tough place to uh to try and come up here he is lift, working out with a, a metal bus stop sign as his right. dumbbells <laughs> right. these pictures are amazing yeah. really amazing and then there's Thank a picture you. of him with a beautiful car like an Austin Healey that's shot down from a rooftop it looks like well, let me ask you a bunch of Steve McQueen uh, Brentwood questions sure. because uh, I I know he used to call the house up the street here the castle, right? Um, and I've been in it, and uh, you know I helped uh, the Peterson Auto Museum bring the the Jaguar XKSS up there for a photo shoot uh, last year, maybe the year before. Um, there's a rumor in our neighborhood that the speed bumps that we have are because of James Garner and Steve McQueen racing up and down the street in Austin Mini Coopers. And families being <laughs> upset. <laughs> McQueen lives, uh, I mean, uh, 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 James Garner lived right down the street, too. Do you Have you ever heard that story? I, I have not. Uh, I, I, would, <laughs> I would have to believe that he would have some respect for his neighborhood. Now, I do mm. know this, is that he did race his motorcycles uh, up and down Mulholland. Because Mulholland, he got a lot right. Of, he got a lot of tickets from cops up there. Yes. But yeah, I would think he'd have a little bit more respect. But he did have a, a, a he did have an Austin Healey, so that part is true. You know, it was an Austin Mini Cooper was uh, was the car that they were in Mini Coopers. He, you know, also I remember hearing a story from uh, Bert Olander at Circle Porsche, an old uh, car salesman who worked for Vashak Polak uh, uh, back in the day, who had given Steve the keys to a 911 R an old 911R that he picked up on a Friday and returned on Monday morning and said, if I keep this car, I'm going to get too many tickets, too many speeding tickets. I'm going to get arrested. And, you know, that, that kind of indicates what you're saying, that he wasn't exactly bombing around neighborhoods. So uh, the, the Brentwood house then is at what point in his career? Where, you know, it's, tell me how he comes to, to buy this beautiful house up here and when he leaves it. Well, uh, he, this comes right on the heels, right before The Great Escape hits. So The Great Escape is released in July of 63. He buys this house in February of 63. And they're house hunting because they're, 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 they've outgrown their home on Solar Drive. 
mm-hmm. and he's about to become this big movie star, but just not yet. So he's a little nervous and this realtor comes and takes him to this house and she's not talking price. And he says, um, he, he gave an anecdote that uh, as, as the higher he climbed to the house, the more dollar signs that he saw in his eyes. And he's, <laughs> and then he says 10, not, but 10 minutes later, they said, yes, we want the house. So, um, and the quote, you, the quote you have is beautiful. It's the kind of place I've always dreamed about. I'm my own guy and have my own house where I want it. Our area is called Brentwood, not Hollywood. It's very quiet and there are no cars around, no television wires, no smog, no traffic, no people with Chinese lanterns or bells or parties. I don't understand that last bit of business. I mean, I live up here and it's quiet. But we have telephone wires. Um, but it was a, it's a very charming quote. What is he talking about? Kind of being out of the rat race of Hollywood and in the suburbs? That's right. Yeah, he, he, he was very proud of the fact that he lived in a family-style neighborhood. But the ironic thing is, and I always tell people this, like, do you know how close that is to the Sunset Strip? That's all he had to do was just hop on his motorcycle. And five miles away, he's, he's in, in the Sunset Strip. You know, so he he had the best of both worlds. He, right, I mean, as, right. as you know, he was a guy that was not very faithful to his wife. So <laughs> he was um, he'd had the nice family unit in Brentwood, but then again, just hop on the bike and then boom, he was right there in the heart. And he of called the he Street. called that house the, ca- the the castle, right? Right, and that's what it resembled. It's a it's a beautiful house. I mean, it's unlike anything you've seen before. Um, we and, were up there. We go up all the time. It's got a it's got a guardhouse at the bottom, like a big stone, Yellowstone guardhouse that looks old. And as the big wooden gates open in, it takes you <clears throat> up. It's like about maybe an acre property, and it takes you around the bottom up to the top. And the house sits on top of the property, almost right. like on a flat hilltop with little uh, guest houses off to the side and a pool. And what I didn't know about it, I've seen it in pictures, but what I love about it is it's it's really focused on the garage. Like yeah. you just want to drive up that road and you want to park right in the center of that courtyard. And it's got these three garage bay. It's really a beautiful car guy home. And the house is like kind of small by comparison. <laughs> Yeah. How long? How long did he live here in this neighborhood? He lived there uh, from again sixty three to I think he moved out in seventy one. That's when he got divorced from Neil. But my, one of my favorite quotes in the book is he's he's in he's in the driveway and he's talking about a Tony Curtis Tony Curtis article that he had read, and um, he said you know when when Tony Curtis became so successful he had. He, he, he walked out to the driveway and he didn't know what car to take. Mm-hmm. And McQueen said, when I, first, you know, when I first started scoring, I would buy every motorcycle. I'd buy every a piece of clothing. And he goes, and then I got into cars. And then he said something to the effect of, and damned if I didn't do what Tony Curtis did. And I've got this beautiful yeah. picture of him <laughs> looking at two cars, contemplating which one he's going to take to work that day. I saw that, and it's interesting. It's another interesting little piece of the puzzle that Tony Curtis is really responsible for the car collecting in some (laughs) ways, right, and focusing it in, and it's always that way. There's always someone in in your life, if you're a car collector, that it kind of inspires you to do the same thing, and I had no clue it was Tony Curtis. Um, And I love that that, uh, which car do I drive uh, anxiety? Such a funny (laughs) observation that we, you know, if you have more than one car, you do have that moment. I never think of it as like, oh, this is great. (laughs) It's kind of like, (laughs) ah, what haven't I driven? What what do I get? What kind of maintenance do I have to do? Um, So, you know, from your point of view, you've been, you know, why were you so into Steve McQueen? What's your connection to Steve? It's an emotional one in that um, my dad was the original McQueen fan. My dad just passed away at 83 years old in July, and um, he watched One of Dead or Alive. But when I was a little bit older, McQueen then became a movie star. And so what he would do was he would, he would come and he'd take me out of school, and we would go see the McQueen picture together. So it was a bonding thing. Um, and I found out as I traveled throughout the world doing these book signings that I wasn't the only one, that this was a kind of a love that fathers had passed on down to their sons and now to their grandsons. So um, McQueen, the reason kind of why he's iconic and eternal is, uh, you know, I use that as an illustration as to why. 
so that's that's my first connection. And then as I got older, um, I connected to him just because you know there's something about him that as an actor, you don't really care about most actors, but, but you care about McQueen beyond his acting. You, you care about him as a human being. Um, and then of course, then you start to understand and learn the story and then you go, okay, well, that's why I care about him. Cause that vulnerability just pops out on the screen. Right. Here he is uh, on page 93 in his 58 speedster with Rudge knockoff wheels. License plate clearly visible, PNC 232. That's the crap that makes me nuts. Um, There's so many great shots here. God, I'm going to have another cigar tonight and go back through it. I I, I really love this book. It's... uh, Boy, boy. and then then we're not even into all all the film stuff. Well, thank you. And I'll, I'll tell you the reason why I did the book was because, and, and again, I'll, I'll qualify this with, I, this is my seventh book on Steve McQueen. So <laughs> I'm going to say stop. I, I'm guiltier than, than anyone else. So, But I've seen, I, I've seen your books and, and they're good, but this thing has, you know, it's the, per, it's the perfect size of in an Instagram age. Yeah. It's the, it's almost like Instagram posts put into a book where you could sit down for a few hours and go through it and really soak up who this guy was and what he was about because the quotes are so carefully chosen and the photographs are, you know, really amazing to see. And I haven't, hadn't seen them before, you know, and you get some, it, it, it's almost like you're on a museum tour and there's a guide giving you a tour and whispering in your ear about the, the painting and wow. you get just enough, you know what I mean? And it, 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 it it's it's good. <laughs> well, like you're, it. you're 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 answering the mystery to me because like this book, I don't know what it is. It's connecting more with people, and I couldn't quite figure it out. That's but. what it is. We all have short attention spans, yeah. and it's a guided tour to this guy's life. You know, like you, that we all have a connection to. Let me. I want to ask you before you go. Um, the Steve McQueen uh, collecting multiple that anything he's touched is now worth like 30 times its normal value. His overalls from the movie Le Mans sold for a million dollars, wow. right? The car, it, you know, two, two, maybe three part question. One, is there more stuff out there in your research that you've seen that has not come to market uh, cars and memorabilia? Well, there's one piece that I've seen that, that we tried selling and it didn't work, but it's, it's, it's this box. It's this trunk from this movie called Yucatan that it was going to do right after bullet. Mm-hmm. And it's this unbelievable decadent script, but with pictures and they only made three of these trunks. And what happened was, is that he was going to make it, he was going to make it after Le Mans, then Le Mans crashed. And then he had to scrap that idea. And mm-hmm. so that, to me, that, that is almost like the Holy Grail because there's only three of them. Chad, the son, has one of them. Um, a couple, the, the other two associated with the movie have it. That's a piece <laughs> of memorabilia that I would personally like to have that I think is going to be worth a lot of money but, someday. But, I, but, but, like, you know, I heard once the sunglasses sold for a lot of money, well, mm-hmm. one of the wives said, boy, if I'd known they were worth that much, I would have given them the other 10 pair. <laughs> so, <laughs> like sunglasses and watches and cars have you come across and motorcycles stuff like that that we don't know about well yeah th- there's some collections that i know of but the reason i think one of the reasons that you asked the question is why is it worth so much well no no hold on no hold on okay <laughs> you said you got some collections that you know of yes what, what what can you tell us about that well like there's a collection uh from somebody uh that knew Steve McQueen in the Santa Paula days where there are a lot of there's still some antiques out there you know lamps stuff that he collected that was in his house yeah um you know worth but not it. cards cars and watches no 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 no, no, no. that that's <laughs> okay. the high end I just want to be clear <laughs> what we're talking about on Spike's car radio <laughs> is other cars that Steve no. McQueen might have owned or motorcycles no, we're, you know, with the cars and stuff, we're getting to an area now where, it, you know, it's been owned three and four times over. So, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so at the end of his life, I think he had 53 cars and like 150 motorcycles. That so now we're just, we're, we're just getting, yeah, we're just getting into an area now where they're just, just getting resold and resold. Wow. I didn't know that. That's a lot. I, that's more than I thought. I mean, I had awareness of the Husqvarna motorcycles, and the, and Chad has the Speedster, and uh, I know there's a camper truck that comes up every once yep. in a while. 
Right. But, but what did you say? There were 50, 53 many? cars and about 150 motorcycles and a lot of unfinished motorcycles. He had a warehouse in Ventura where he had a full-time Indian mechanic just rebuilding mm-hmm. his bikes for him. Wow. His name is Sammy Pierce, and he's well-known in the Indian world. Yeah. Well, that, <clears throat> to me, is uh, – that's it. That's his turn, t- Tony Curtis moment. When you got a guy there building stuff for you, <laughs> that's your own works kind of mechanics bay to make stuff. Well, um, this is great. It's well, really been you. fun talking to you. I mean, I could just go for days. I'm flying through this and looking at the pictures. <clears throat> I just want to encourage everybody to uh, get – it's Marshall Terrell, right? That's how I pronounce your last name. Yes. Marshall Terrell's uh, new book um, that's going to be available on Amazon December 1st is called In His Own Words. In His Own Words, Marshall Terrell, Steve McQueen. It is a must-buy for the hol- holiday season. If you absolutely need it now, where do they go? Uh, DaltonWatson.com. DaltonWatson.com. Um, Marshall, we're going to have you back to talk some more Steve McQueen now that we have our Steve McQueen historian uh, on our it. speed dial. It's uh, been a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Take care. There it is. We learned a lot, Zuckerman. That was fantastic. It was good, wasn't it? I love being there. <laughs> He's signing a book for you and a book for me. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. This is one of the few books <laughs> where I was really sincerely, I really I sincerely know. loved it. Because you only read porn. Uh, no, I don't read porn. Oh, yes, you that's your reading you, level, <laughs> porn. <laughs> you look at it. You exactly, look at that's it. your reading level. You know level. who advertises <laughs> on porn, by the way? Blue Chew. They're all over it. I don't know how I would know that. But, um... Anyway, thank you, Marshall, for coming on. I want to thank Hodinky. Um, yeah. Download the Hodinky app. Download the Hodinky app. Even if you're not going to get their insurance, you're going to want to read their stories and buy their watches. We own a few of those. But uh, you should insure your big dog watches in your collection. Big dog. And Woof. do them uh, one at a time. Um, thank you for joining us here on Spike's Car Radio. Thank you to Bill, who every weekend saves us spots. Love Make Bill. sure you stop by the Malibu Kitchen. And, and- don't call him Stanley. And order your uh, Thanksgiving meals, especially the pies. We'll see you next week on Spikes Car Radio. Thanks for listening to Spikes Car Radio, brought to you by Hangar 56. Listen to new episodes every Wednesday. And be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Hey, guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.